I mean, it has just been a historic day in Washington, D.C. Two country first leaders, President Donald Trump and U.K. Prime Minister Theresa May, just wrapping up their press conference. And the importance cannot be overstated as both nations seem to be standing at a precipice. Trump and May starting from square one, forging these new trade agreements and putting the kibosh on others. In turn, other nations appear to be maybe starting to go rogue. Spain, not in keeping with EU standards, apparently is making noises about wanting to make its own deal with the UK after Brexit as a fish is official as soon as possible. Then you've got Italy and France among some of the other names considering their own exits from the EU. Remember Frexit and Leavity or Italy. leave. <laughs> Brexit, Italy. leave. So how will the European Union hold its alliance together. Let us bring in somebody who says he will do it with the team there. David O'Sullivan, EU's ambassador to the U.S. and a Fox Business exclusive. Welcome, Ambassador. Uh, it, it sure looks like there are Thank a you. lot of side deals being struck, unilateral, bilateral, but not certainly these broader regional deals. Does that forebode negative things for the Eurozone? No, not in the slightest. Uh, I think that the European Union negotiates as a single trading bloc. We are the largest uh, trading bloc in the world and the, the wealthiest single market. By the way, we're the single biggest export market for the United States. We're the biggest uh, uh, destination for your foreign direct investment, as, by the way, we are the largest source of foreign direct investment in the United States. Uh, we see great advantages in negotiating as a single bloc. Mm -hmm. And, by the way, for American companies, they get access to a single market. And if we were to to have 28 separate national regimes, this would actually be a nightmare for American business. But I think Europeans also see that benefit. We're actively engaged in negotiations. We're just about to conclude a major deal with Canada. We're actively engaged with Japan. Uh, we're engaged with uh, countries in the, in the Asian uh, Pacific area. Uh, so I think, and by the way, we're upgrading our free trade agreement with Mexico, which goes back a couple of years okay, now. See, so the European what, uh, Union trade policy is alive and well and, and, and operating as uh, an integrated Block. Tell me if I'm looking too deeply into this, but it looks like that there are going to be sudden voids, yawning gaps. If Donald Trump has an argument, we know he has already with Mexico, it looks like the European Union says, oh, let us shift in there. China says, oh, the U.S. is out of TPP, let us shift in there in, in almost lightning speed. But you've also got these elections in Europe, and that's why I come back to the European Union in that block. You had Angela Merkel's deputy, Sigmar Gabriel, warning that the EU could splinter and break apart if populists win French and Dutch elections. Uh, he says they're enemies of Europe. Hostilities to Europe have reached dangerous levels. So as we're keeping an eye on what's going on here at the Pentagon here in the United States, uh, you've got to explain to me how you feel when Spain, a member of the European Union, says let's begin trade talks with uh, the UK and we're sympathetic to Britain's request to exit and renegotiate deals at the same time. Well, I think you have to distinguish between two things. I mean, one is the future negotiation with the United Kingdom, once they have formally notified us of their intention to leave, which has not yet happened, where we will have to negotiate the exit of the United Kingdom from the European Union and then a new relationship of some kind. And that's a, a separate process which will start once the British government formally notifies its intention to leave. And, of course, all our member states have an interest in that happening as smoothly and as expeditiously as possible. The other issue is the European Union uh, still at 28 until the UK leaves, but at 27 if and when they leave, mm -hmm. wishing to be uh, a, a, an active force for trade liberalization globally. Uh, we are indeed negotiating, as I've said, with many, with many other countries. We will continue with that. I don't think it's a question of stepping in to fill a vacuum. We've had a trade deal. We've had a, an FTA with Mexico going back 10, 15 years. Of we course. simply are discussing with the Mexicans how we would uh, upgrade that to be a more modern 21st century trade deal. I just want to let our viewers know that you're looking at uh, General Mattis right now awaiting President Donald Trump and uh, again there is the parking lot the cars are still there's still a few spaces open the green cone is to the right you can't really see it but it's holding his space I promise you uh, in the meantime uh, ambassador let's let's talk a little bit about NATO there was a pretty interesting moment where Angela Merkel said NATO uh, we're 100 percent behind NATO. So is Donald Trump, who is now arriving, as you can see, with this uh, motorcade. Uh, your quick thought on NATO and maintaining the cohesiveness there. 
Look, uh, NATO is absolutely indispensable to the security of uh, the transatlantic alliance, to the European countries and to the United States uh, and Canada. But did it surprise uh, you that you she have put a... those words in his mouth? She said uh, Donald Trump is 100 percent behind NATO. He said the complete opposite just a few weeks ago. He said it's obsolete. Well, I, I, I can only, I, I, like you, I heard the, the press conference and I heard what Prime Minister May said and I think she was expressing the view of all the European partners in, in NATO. We believe America has a major strategic interest in, in NATO and in the peace and stability in the European region uh, and we're certain that we know that this government, this administration is going to take a long hard look at the full range of policies but we're absolutely sure that even the most forensic examination of those policies will show that a prosperous, stable and united European Union and NATO is absolutely indispensable to the security and prosperity of the United States. You know, you made a comment about trade. A lot of our investor audience own stocks that do quite a bit of business in Europe, not to mention an Intel, for example, or an Apple, Sears, Dole Food, Home Depot, Lowe's, you name it. Um, what would you say to Americans to shed your side of this opinion as we watch the motorcade pull up with Donald Trump in it? Because he says, listen, we've got to get better deals for our workers. Well, I would say that the European Union uh, welcomes American investment. Those companies you've mentioned, we, we absolutely value their investment, the jobs they create in Europe. We have many European companies who invest and create jobs uh, in the United States. Uh, and we are, um, one, we are the major source of foreign direct investment in the United States. Uh, and we create many, many millions of jobs here. Trade and investment between, Europe and the, Europe, between the United States and the European Union is a win-win situation for both America and for the people of Europe and I'm sure that that's going to continue to be the case. We have General James Mattis standing at attention waiting for the president to exit his vehicle at this very moment at the Pentagon. The president is expected to meet with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. There is word that he will be discussing because he has asked all ideas on the table on how to battle ISIS. This has become, Ambassador, a huge problem in Belgium, in Germany, of course, on the island of Lesbos in Greece, where many we have a lot of immigrants who are coming, who are fleeing ISIS. What has really happened in Europe? It, it's not a positive. Well, I think that we have had a, a, a dramatic situation in Syria, one of the greatest humanitarian crises of our generation, to be very frank, the, the displacement of millions of people, not to mention the death uh, and, and injury of many more. Uh, we have had to make our part in, in contributing to helping those people. We have done that. Uh, we will continue to try and provide asylum where we can. But of course, we also want to uh, help the, the neighboring countries uh, who are housing many millions of these refugees provide financial assistance to them and ultimately we would like to find a solution to the root cause. You mentioned ISIS and ISIL. The European Union and its member states constitute 40 percent of the anti-ISIL coalition and our member states are very active both militarily and in other ways. So I think this is a common cause between Europe and the United States and we will continue okay. to stand together in this, in this struggle. And